Thank you, everyone. And I'd like to warn the audience first that despite the extreme sexiness of our title, Crazy Rich Asians will not be about, uh, in particular, attractive young people in Singapore, uh, like the Hollywood movie. Instead, we'll be talking about something much bigger, which is, uh, in large part, the shift in attention uh, for almost every uh, big agenda-setting issue in the world today from uh, Western-dominated spheres of interest to uh, either bipolar or actually uh, Asian-leaning um, stage, to put it uh, very metaphorically. We're talking about how much more important China and other parts of Asia are in the world's economy and pretty much every big development. And uh, consequently, and not just consequently, how much less important um, uh, traditional Western countries uh, are. Now, to start, I'd like to um, turn to my colleague Dipanjan Roy Choudhury at, uh, at uh, the Economic Times. Uh, we'll we'll uh, turn next to, uh, to Dr. Sh uh, Shaila Fennell and Chokan Laumulan from, uh, from the Cambridge Central Asian Forum. Um, but I wanted to begin with uh, Dipanjan because I had questions uh, before we get into China, the U.S. and whatnot about India's role specifically in, uh, in this rise of the East uh, story. And, and I'm hoping in particular that you can provide us with some optimism. I know that uh, both of our other speakers um, are keen to talk about some of the problems uh, faced by Asia and its inexorable rise. Uh, Dipanjan, where do you see uh, India playing its role in this story? India geographically is uh, very well poised to play a role in the Indo-Pacific. You know, what uh, many people have been focusing in the last couple of years in Indo-Pacific is the uh, eastern front of India and the oceans. Uh, but we, if you look at it, India is sort of the connecting power between the Eurasia and the Indo-Pacific, the ocean part. And uh, in many ways, uh, it can be called an Asia-Pacific. It's an Asia-Indo-Pacific, in my opinion, or Indo-Asia-Pacific, in my opinion. And we are naturally connected. If we are naturally connected to Myanmar and Singapore and Philippines by the seas, we are naturally connected to Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan by the land and in an undivided India, it, it was a free flow, right? Today, uh, there are certain difficulties in having an easy access. Uh, we are trying to have an access through uh, Iran, the Chabahar port, and the uh, uh, INSTC, International North-South Corridor, which remain frozen as of date because of certain, you know, uh, the customs is from customs to connectivity issues. But uh, India is, is naturally aligned to play a role, at least the northwestern part of India, geographically aligned, as well as western part of India, geographically aligned, to play a role in the western part of Indo-Pacific, which also connects eastern part of Africa to Oman, to Iran, to the landlocked Central Asia, and to the western part of India. So, and for those countries, India is a link to Southeast Asia, and something like if, if they have, a, you know, there are certain talks of the Eurasian Economic Union, and maybe in India can be a bridge between say, Vietnam and that region, or Singapore, which is in F talks in FTA with Eurasian Equinium. So India could be could be the uh, could be the um, uh, focal power, focal point. But definitely our challenges lie with connectivity as well as resources, capacity building. Okay, Panchan, keep the microphone because I have to ask you to say at least a few words about the significance of the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. Uh, the one Belt, One Road initiative of China's. You've just described India's uh, potential geographically as if there weren't this world-spanning trillion dollar project to connect the world around India, which doesn't actually include India. I think, in fact, every Asian country but India and Bhutan uh, is a part of this planned network. Uh, are you skeptical about the importance of BRI for I, the world's future? I am skeptical because of BRI so far. You know, the Chinese have moderated BRI in the last couple of years because of the pushback. But it's, it's India was the only country which actually led that pushback. You know, every, almost all big powers were represented in the last Belt and Road Summit in 2017 in Beijing. And I expect that almost all powers will be again present in the next Belt and Road Summit in Beijing this April, May. The dates have not been announced. India has, has certainly laid down principles. Despite having a difficult boundary with China, and despite having uh, you know, uh, uh, technologically and military gap with China, which will take somewhere two decades to bridge if China grows at 0% for the next 10 years, and we grow at 8, 7, 8%, we may, we may still have a, have a gap. Yet, India took a principal position 
of, of not subscribing to the view of One Belt, One Road, which it thinks is a, is a project which connects uh, you know, the countries through a mechanism which is not transparent, which doesn't have financial viability in the long run, and may have goals and objectives which is not very clear. Some of this project exists before. It's, it's, it's only when President Xi Jinping came, he put it under one umbrella, made it something, a grand, you know, every president in China has to have a grand vision. Like in many other countries, everybody has a grand vision. And he wanted to be the next Mao, and he, he put everything together and put it under the Belt and Road Initiative. And some of these existed. Many of the projects in Pakistan existed, right? And, you know, in, in terms of Eurasia, China is very contiguous to these regions. You know, to go to Africa, China has to come via ocean. To go to Latin America, China has to come via ocean. To come to Bay of Bengal, it has to also. But for, for Central Asia, it's very natural for them. It's, it's automatic, exchange, uh, you know, sort of extension. The countries need money. Most of these countries who have been part of Belt and Road need the finances. It's, you know, you, you, we cannot deny this fact. And Central Asia needs, particularly Kyrgyzstan, uh, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, they need you know, they're they are landlocked countries, except for Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, who has a, a well-oiled sort of uh, economic system, and particularly Uzbekistan, which is in the last two years, has, is showing a lot of promise. The region needs money. Russia needs money, particularly after the sanctions uh, which was imposed, you know, uh, 2014. And they have started looking eastwards rather than the westward, right? Mm -hmm. In 2012, Putin was looking westwards. Now he's looking eastwards, right? So they need money. And, and of course, China is going to take an advantage of the situation, right? Um, it sounds sounds not not necessarily skeptical of China's importance, but uh, but of of its uh, effects of its influence. Um, Chokan, uh, something that you were telling me about just before our session uh, might be uh, might strike a more optimistic chord. Um, the importance, the centrality of uh, science and technology leadership in uh, in international leadership these days. Uh, how how do you see? Um, China, other parts of Asia, India notably, um, uh, assuming that leadership or more of it. Yeah, thank you. Once technology is concerned, I think it's a crucial element for the modern economy today. For instance, in this situation which is, um, implies, uh, in the situation which implies the title of this discussion, in, um, there is a shift from allegedly from the, in power, from the West to the East. But actually, there is nothing new in the situation when Asia produces a significant part of the global product. For instance, a couple of centuries ago, in some estimation, China produced up to one-third of the global product. However, history of the 19th and 20th century revealed that technology is crucial in establishing the new world orders which followed. And uh, in this sense, it's very important that technology, uh, understanding of technology. Technology is the prescriptive knowledge of knowing how. Whereas it's not possible, and it's actually coming from science, which is a propositional knowledge of knowing what. And thus, this makes science, and of course education, the most important and key element of modern economy and development of technology. And um, in this sense, designing an uh, appropriate policy, science, education, and social ones, uh, becomes a priority in development. And in this sense, India has a lot to do. Even uh, if in number of university, India is number three globally, mm -hmm. lagging behind only the US and China, and having more than possibly 500 universities and having really truly remarkably uh, fantastic higher education institutions, it's still not enough. I remember while attending for the first time one Globe Forum seven or eight years ago, there was a large discussion that India would need to launch 400 universities within the five next years. And now I'm wondering what, what really was done in this sense. Clearly, the country needs a new policy because uh, in, in this direction, because looking at, at the portion of um, GDP allocation for development of research, and it's just 0.8%, uh, 
and the ratio of uh, researchers, which is 800 per 1 million, is not enough. While OECD nation invest, investing in average 2.4% of their GDP into research. And what is important talking about Asia, we, there are two good examples. Asia and the Southeast uh, Asian uh, countries? Or other? Overall Asia, okay. as it, it, it exists in Western uh -huh. paradigm. Uh -huh. So the first remarkable example is South Korea, which is actually, along with Israel, are world leaders in relevant terms. They invest uh, around 4.25% of GDP into res mm. research and development. And, and China. China is uh, number two in absolute terms after the US, and number one in number of scientific publications already. Uh, but it is, it's invest around 2%, but it's a huge number of its GDP into the research. However, what is important, the US invests 17% of, of its allocation into development of fundamental science, whereas China only five. But even those 5% of those 2% of GDP make uh, a tremendous change within last year when we can see growing uh, power of China. Thus, what I mean, it's a development of a new science, technology, and education policy is the key element of modern development. Hmm. Thank you. Um, Shayla, time to turn to you for um, what might be a more downbeat uh, subject or series of subjects. Um, Take your pick. You've, you've uh, mentioned a, a variety of uh, respects in which uh, these new Asian centers of power need to watch out for the developmental uh, obstacles ahead. What, what are the major problems? So first, uh, I, thank you very much. I don't think it's a doom and gloom story. I think it's a very exciting story. It is a story about rich Asians and rich Asian countries. But along with richness uh, and the bottom is rising, it's not, I mean, poverty levels are falling, the world's poverty levels fell at the end of the Millennium Development Goals, and half of that was the reduction in poverty that China alone made. So there are huge steps in advances in terms of income generation. Um, if there is a challenge, it's how that is distributed. And I'm not here um, claiming that we should have a socialist redistribution, I'm just setting the facts. And the facts are fascinating. The craziest Asians are, are in the cities because that's where the inequality is the highest. OECD in 2016 in its last study showed that um, while incomes are rising in cities, overall inequality in cities is also rising. So you've got the global earners who are across Asia now, and you've got the bottom which is rising, but it's not rising at the same rate. And that raises a huge issue. This is something that we discussed in the earlier panels today, particularly the health crisis. Um, Today, um, China, India, both in East Asia, if we exclude Japan, and sort of you look at South Korea, China, India, all the way through to, to Sri Lanka, the levels of GDP spent on health are not the same percentage as the OECD countries did at the same level of GDP growth. Mm. So there's been a huge rise in health investment, but a much greater proportion has been from the private sector. And we had an excellent panel where the Secretary for the Ministry of Health spoke about these challenges. And it does mean that a different model needs to be in place. So if we look at the PPP model, um, CSR, those kinds of models that come about, there's a triple bottom line. And I think the PPPs need to look at profit, but also look at projects that could be viable for the middle and bottom, and include people. And that includes the stories about smart cities, a number of issues where inequality should not be seen as this, this terrible, you know, monster. But it's uh, trying to find different financial vehicles for different groups to share in that prosperity. So the first point I want to make is Gini coefficients aren't bad, but they're really a nice measure of trying to understand how you distribute. The second point I'd like to make in relation to this is um, the point that Chokan has raised around knowledge creation and the point that was made by Dipanjan in terms of opportunities through infrastructural investment. I think really the possibility of linking mobility as one of the earlier panels talked about in terms of linking transport to investment in public goods is critical. And I, I want to talk about an aside that came across in my last visit to Singapore. I was talking to a, a young colleague who had previously been a student and I had taken the metro to visit her. And she made a very stark comment and she said, but Dr. Fennell, the metro is for the service class. 
And I just kind of stepped back because I thought the Singapore Metro was one of the coolest, the best. And really what I'm talking about is this opportunity of knowledge societies for inclusion, but the challenge of exclusion. And Asia has, and that was one thing that came out in the movie, which I watched yesterday because I thought I had to talk about the movie today. Thank <laughs> God we're not talking about the movie. Um, but the, the challenge is, what is a service class? How do we think about the as aspirants to the middle class? And do we think about them also being citizens in, in this global economy? And I want to say this because uh, I was struck about this in the AI panel in particular, that the service class or the skills of providing knowledge uh, infrastructure investment is crucial, particularly because we don't know where the jobs are going to be. So people talked about AI and it might displace particular individuals. I think it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity because there is such a huge skill gap. So McKinsey started this in 2014. The latest is Government of India's own work with private sector, EY and others on the skill gap. And something like 86% of India's youth who are educated, so they've overcome the education gap, are employable, but not ready for employment. So you're saying you've taken so many exams, you must be good for something. And, and this is really quite a challenge. So I think the point I'm trying to make is here, if we're thinking about skills, then we've got to think about the link between future jobs. So it's using transferable skills, not preparing for the task and then delivery for today's jobs. And then that raises the question that was raised in, in the panel on cities themselves, and that's the gender gap across these countries. And there's a fascinating difference. So in a country like South Korea or Japan, young women who are a much greater percentage of the STEM subjects in Asia than they are across UK or the US, in the US it's 17%, in, in the UK it's 21, it's closer to 30% in East Asian countries. We have what we call an M-shaped curve. So they're quite high when they enter the employment market, then around the age of marriage, they fall. And then again in their 40s, when they have raised their children, they go back in. India is really interesting. We don't have an M. We just have a downward slide. So we get an incredible number of bright women engineers, but they don't go into the labor force. So there's some interesting differences across Asian countries. And I want to end with the, in, the, the figure that while in East Asia and in South Asia, inequality Gini, is rising about 1% a year. It's falling in Southeast Asia. So it's falling in countries like Vietnam and others, which are doing more for public policy than the classic South and East Asia. I'll stop there. I've got some more, but it'll turn into a lecture otherwise. Oh, I'm going to ask a couple more questions of the, the panel. Uh, uh, Shayla, I might start with you, actually. Um, I'm, I'm too fascinated by this remark you made about um, I'm not sure, is it, is it actually that inequality is decreasing in, in those Southeast Asian nations? Actually decreasing, not just uh, not accelerating as quickly as in the rest. I wonder if you could uh, say something. You, you, you determined not to call for a socialist redistribution of um, wealth at the outset of your remarks, but what should we expect, do you, do you suppose, in terms of China, the very biggest uh, new pits of inequality in the region, which, um, apart from India, maybe Indonesia these days, they tend not to be democracies. In fact, there's been a subtle retreat from democracy around much of this continent during the period we're talking about. Um, what do you actually anticipate uh, in terms of uh, the, this growth of inequality? Is it going to get much worse before it gets better? Good point. If we look at the sort of high, high, high headline figures, Piketty's work some years ago, and everyone was really concerned globally that inequality levels across the world, barring none, were higher at the end of the 20th century than the end of the 19th century. And if you're being total doomsday prediction, then you'd go, oh, well, the fourth industrial revolution is going to be far worse for inequality than the first industrial revolution. I don't think so, but I think there's a, a warning, and with the warning come possibilities of doing things differently. On Southeast Asia, we forget, there's a huge player called Indonesia. It's a very important player. It's had 8 to 9% rate of growth. It has a different model because it's a whole range of islands and they've got challenges on decentralization. But they're a country to watch. And you know, if we talk about BRICS and BRICSies, you know, one of the eyes in that BRICSies should be Indonesia. So there are players that are very important. We don't just see them as the same model. And one of the things that Indonesia is doing is going into human capital investment. They're pushing hugely to try and increase those possibilities. That doesn't detract from your very central question, which I didn't address, which is, what does it mean for democracy? I think decentralization is a way to understand 
a um, everyday use of democracy, where you talk about people participating in projects. And that's something that's happening. So for example, the city of Yogyakarta, which is the second biggest city in Jakarta, nobody wants to go to Jakarta. You get to the plane, you get off at the airport, and you spend six hours in traffic. Yogyakarta is different. They're using Buddhist principles. They're thinking about redoing. They're talking about greening. There are other lessons. And I think moving away from capital cities, possibly to tier two and tier three, where there is good practice, might be another way of looking at the solution. And then the BRI may not seem to be such a bogeyman either. Because if the BRI is happening in an environment where other countries have got clear ideas of what kind of infrastructure projects they want, then you've got a talking point. I think the reason the BRI is a problem because other countries haven't got their act together. And maybe at the next meeting that's what will happen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and and Chokan, if, if I may ask something that I, I'm not sure I got right, um, you, you uh, we're concentrating just now on the uh, important role that basic uh, research yep. plays in the rise of, of a country as a leader. Um, uh, Shayla was, was talking almost uh, right after about the, the sometimes horrifying mismatch between the kind of educations that uh, our tertiary institutions in India are churning out and the kind of jobs or needs for those educations that we find. Do you think that, um, that India, to use the example at hand, uh, should be worried more about the amount of money that goes to basic research, this 0.8%, or about the actual educational outcomes? Um. Um, the thing is, it's um, designing a comprehensive policy is mm. important. Uh, you can't really say that while increasing uh, allocation for basic research would diminish the importance of social approaches and everything, and, and vice versa, the technology is coming from social milieu, which is uh, this ecosystem is extremely important. Um, because um, what is interesting, that science and its development, it's coming not from political or economic even, con even concept, as driven by scientist curiosity. So it's which making social approach is extremely important for science and thus for technology, engineering, and finally, innovation and economy. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Difficult, uh, you, you don't want to shortchange any side of the <laughs> equation. Um, Dipanjan, I, I wanted to, to give you a chance to say uh, something more about the BRI if you wanted to. I felt I cut you off a little bit short there. Uh, I think, um, you know, there is this, uh, the, the countries uh, which, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia and, and Africa, you know, uh, uh, we, we know certain countries operate in certain system, like Cambodia, you know, it's, we know uh, it's a one-man show and his son, you know, and they found, uh, you know, and of course the West was not ready to, you know, there are issues of human rights and sometimes we see it in a different way in, uh, I'm just talking about in Myanmar, you know, and the U.S. Congress may see it in a different way in terms of when the U.S. wants to uh, uh, do a project in, in Myanmar, say, in terms of the uh, either with jointly with India or, 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 or solely, they of course has concerns with the human rights and other issues. Uh, similarly, with, with with Africa, you know there are issues, and, and uh, particularly uh, you know some of the Western donors uh, may not come uh, forward with that. You know. But you know there China comes there. You know they couldn't care less. Uh, I'm talking very bluntly about about the records of the of the various leaders or, you know, some of the leaders in Africa have been there in power for, say, 20 years. I take, for example, Djibouti, you know. But Djibouti is, is, is more uh, plural, uh, you know, sorry, more, uh, I think, even-handed. They have base from every country. Uh, so, but some of those countries have realized, I think there was some gov change in governments in some of these countries, for example, Sierra Leone or Malaysia. And they've they incurred a huge debt, you know. Uh, and you know, how to service that debt, and, and therefore they have scrapped some of the projects, and Malaysia has led the way. Yeah, Malaysia right. Malaysia and Maldives so, both. Ma Maldives so. both. Uh, and Maldives was, you know, uh, we thought it was in a precarious situation, it was not as precarious. After the, you know, some internal service was conducted, uh, and a Western power helped in that. Uh, I would not like to take the name, but, you know, it was not as, as, as bad at which so It's actually a, a growing economy in the Maldives, and the base is much more than 300,000 people. Uh, 
I think China is trying to moderate it now, you know, at least uh, in the time being given the China-US relations, you know. Uh, they have reached out to Japan, Singapore, India. Uh, last time Singapore was not uh, a member, in, uh, didn't partic was not invited to participate in Belt and Road. This time it might be invited. And uh, I think they, they are looking at the reactions from various countries and they would probably, uh, you know, uh, moderate, you know, in, you know, kind of bring in more transparency in funding, uh, make some of the goals clear, you know. Uh, we, so we know about Gwadar or Hambantuta, that's more open, you know, in terms of but a base uh, like a port in uh, Portugal or, or uh, Greece or Italy, right? Yeah. right. It, Italy says, uh, Italy says that it has the capacity not to fall into a situation like Greece, but Greece did. Maybe they, they, they would like to clarify that what is the end objectives of some of these projects, right? I think some of these countries, unlike Indonesia or India, don't have a connectivity plan, you know, uh, like Eastern Europe. You know, large parts of Eastern Europe with good economies, Hungary, uh, you know, uh, you know they, 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 they needed that, you know, to bridge some of the, of the links in Eastern Europe and Central Europe, the link between Serbia and Hungary. That project has been sort of gone slow now, by the way. So maybe China is going to take a relook at some of these and moderate its position and so that it can have maximum support and participation. And it definitely wants India on board on this, which I doubt will happen. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shailaja, uh, Mr. Chakan, and Mr. Dipanjan.